In this episode, I'm joined by Andrew Gallimore, who is a computational neurobiologist, pharmacologist, and chemist interested in psychedelic drugs, especially DMT. In this episode, we talk about his book, Alien Information Theory. I'd like to thank all my paid subscribers and patrons for making all of this possible, and if you'd like to support Hormetics or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Andrew Gallimore, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. You're welcome. Uh, so we're going to be discussing your very recently published book, Alien Information Theory, Psycho- Psychedelic Drug Technologies and the Cosmic Game. Um, yeah. Now, before we even sort of venture into trying to explain this book, because usually I can think, yeah, I'll be able to explain this. Not not so much for this one. So, But before we jump in, uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself and... Um, your, your work, what it is you do. Yeah, so, well, I'm, I'm, I guess the, the, the short answer is, is I'm a, I'm a neurobiologist, I'm a chemist, and I'm a pharmacologist, uh, and a writer. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in psychedelic drugs. I've been interested in psychedelic drugs since I was a teenager. And um, kind of that's followed me through through my academic career really you know from from kind of the earliest days of kind of university thinking about you know studying chemistry and pharmacology and being interested in how these drugs work and then later in my academic career becoming more interested in the brain specifically and thinking about how is it possible that these drugs can have such kind of astonishing effects on on the brain and on on the the structure of your world and really just yeah, I just kind of want to know what what's going on with these drugs because you know, DMT specifically, um, you know, it's such a remarkable kind of compound. And you know, ever since I learned about DMT um, from kind of very early Terence McKenna interviews and thing, you know, he would talk about these this astonishing drug, you know, this the most amazing, bizarre thing, and uh, and and you know, you just kind of hear that and you think wow you know what what is this what is this thing what is this technology that's uh, that he's talking about here and um and yeah that's really where it, it all started and um you know the book that you mentioned at the start there is kind of the combination of, of 20 25 years of, of thinking about uh, dmt so i'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here but um <laughs> you, you get the, the point is that I'm, I'm i'm interested in psychedelics i'm interested in what they're doing uh, and and bringing to bear or, you, know, you know a number of different kind of academic disciplines um to try and come up with some kind of explanation for what what these drugs are and what they're doing in the brain okay okay um i'm sure that's all going to come come back up but before we we yeah. venture any further uh, I do have to ask you the hermetics question, which is you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who do you pick? Oh, this is so this is very difficult because, you know, in my kind of there, there are obvious ones that I can choose here. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I could obviously choose, you know, Terence McKenna. And if I didn't choose Terence McKenna, even though it's so fucking obvious, uh, I'd be it'd be kind of a little bit dumb uh, because you know, of what I'm interested in. But I think what what kind of, I guess, uh, I've all, for the last kind of 20 years or so, I've, I've, I've always felt myself, I've always felt there's kind of a, t- a tension in my psychology in there's one part of me that kind of wants to uh, confront the alien overmind, right, that wants to be fired off in, in a spaceship, um, you know, this kind of Terence McKenna idea of kind of leaving the planet. And then there's another part of me that just wants to fuck off into a mountain uh, and drink plum wine and do calligraphy. Um, and, and, and it's still something that I wrestle with. So, uh, you know, it, what, what, what does one do with oneself? And, and I guess I, I'd, want, I'd want thinkers that come from different perspectives in that regard. So I might have you know, Terence McKenna in the middle and then perhaps someone like Philip K. Dick on the one side kind of um, promoting the kind of leaving the earth or hooking us up to the matrix. Uh, And then perhaps someone like Alan Watts or D.T. Suzuki um, uh, kind of 
uh, uh, kind of bring up the other side and, and more of a kind of philosophical kind of a kind of enlightenment approach. And, um, uh, and perhaps I could kind of reconcile those two what appear to me contradictory positions. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's um, it, it's it's and, and I, I find that co- contradictory position in a lot of Terence McKenna's work as well. You know, in one breath, he's talking about leaving the earth. Um, you know, shedding off our material body and, you know, catapulting ourselves into orbit and beyond. And then the next minute he's talking about going back to, you know, the kind of uh, the archaic revival and going back to uh, the forest and, and kind of shamanic rituals. And I don't know whether I'm misunderstanding the whole thing, whether there really is a deep contradiction there. Uh, but I kind of get the feeling that that man is kind of paradoxical in that in one in, in one sense we we do feel this urge to kind of um, drive forward our uh, technological prowess our technological acumen and, and become kind of like this this uh, post-human intelligent species that traverses the galaxy you know this galactic citizens that kind of thing and yet on the other hand uh, we feel that we, we we're kind of we feel drawn back to nature and and we fear losing uh, the the connection with kind of mother nature and uh, I don't know how what would resolve that so perhaps having those kind of three thinkers in the room uh, might um, might go some way uh, in in that direction but I'm not sure so do you think in writing this book it was sort of done in to resolve this tension you have between what answers can be resolved when you um, are completely grounded like someone like Watts who's mindful of their their territory and someone like Philip K. Dick who's you know ramping up his paranoia <laughs> to the point where you know you wouldn't even trust a house plant um, <laughs> you know is this written to resolve that the, there is a connection between these two because both of them are going deep into something but they're going different directions so is this sort of resolving yeah. the the conflict between those two ideas in a way? Well, I, I'm not sure it, 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 it necessarily achieves that. I think maybe it's um, what is it that Tarrant Buchanan used to talk about the um, the coincidentia oppositorum or something, where, where where there's a point where all of these uh, p- contradictory positions kind of flow together, and you realise actually that it's that it's only a surface level contradiction, and then that somehow they're not. Um, the tension is kind of illusory. Uh, perhaps I would I would hope um, that that's the actual truth, and that there's not truly a contradiction. There isn't really this kind of dichotomy between going back to nature or going, uh, you know, heading towards the stars. Uh, but actually, it's part of you know some deeper truth. Um, you know, the, the book was really about, I guess, getting it out of my system. You know, I've been thinking about these drugs or well, thinking about DMT for, as I said, you know, 20, 25 years and had all of these different threads, uh, these kind of partial, partial narratives uh, of trying to kind of piece together the puzzle of uh, work out what 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 DMT is and why it's there and how it's possible for it to have these astonishing effects on consciousness that it does. Um and I thought, okay, you know, that, like maybe sort of three years ago, three or four years ago, I kind of realized that I had a kind of, if I brought all of these little pieces together, these threads together, I, I had something that was approaching a kind of cogent narrative. Uh, and so I thought, okay, well, you know, uh, I could spend the next 20 years kind of refining it, but I think, no, let's let's get it down. Let's get it into a, uh, you know, a coherent form and, and, and kind of just, present it to the world you know i i don't think that it's the final word this isn't the fucking quran <laughs> you know this is um, it's um it's 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 just one particular vision of reality that i've kind of developed uh, over over, uh, over a couple of decades and i felt like yeah now's the kind of the time to to put it out there and, and let people um make what they will of it so how, how would you that- practically describe the book then well, it's it, what the aim of the book was to kind of say, OK, um, you know, where did we come from? What is the kind of the fundamental nature of, of our reality? Uh, you know, did our 
was our reality kind of just sort of a cosmic accident of some sort? Um, how did intelligence emerge within this uh, apparently kind of randomly appearing universe? And, uh, and and what's the role of DMT in all of it? And I, I, I'm, I'm certainly not a creationist or, um, but then again, I'm, I, I'm perplexed by by the by the structure of reality. I, I'm I'm perplexed. I've you know I've always been astonished that um, complex thinking, intelligent beings such as ourselves uh, can emerge. And I do think that we emerged. I don't think that we were molded or sculpted by an intelligence as such. Um, I think that what's kind of uh, remarkable about about the way that nature and way that reality seems to work is that you often have very very simple rules um, and very simple rules governing kind of the way the fundamental pieces of reality interact uh, and and that often leads to very extremely complex behavior and you can see this in computer models uh, I, I use the game of life John Conway uh, the uh, the mathematician who died. Uh, earlier this year, actually, he um, he developed this computer program called the Game of Life, where you've got a, a grid of squares that can either be black or white, uh, and they interact according to four very very simple rules. Uh, and yet, over time, if you let this this game, this zero player game, run, you get the emergence of quite complex, um, self sustaining, uh, emergent structures, um, and. And, and that's kind of the, what I see happening at the ground of reality is that there is this fundamental, what I call the code, uh, which is basically an information generating um, code um, uh, that, you know, so reality is constructed from kind of fundamental bit like objects, you know, basic fundamental p units of information that self organize and self complexify over time. And we find ourselves emergent within. Um, one kind of slice of of reality. Um, you know, building a universe isn't actually that complicated. Um, in that, all you need is to, you know, or sh should I say it? It's it's not difficult to um, to construct a universe like ours if you know the correct rules. If you know what rules are required at the ground of reality, you know, what are the fundamental bits? What are the fundamental units uh, at the ground of your reality? And how are they going to interact? What are the rules of their interaction? Well, if you know the rules of interaction, all you have to do is basically set the, the initial conditions and let the, the universe kind of run. Uh, and eventually, it will start to self-complexify. However, the key point is that knowing the correct rules is almost impossible. Uh, a priori, so you, you can't you, you can't look at all possible rule sets and say this rule set this you know is going is going to lead to complex behaviour. So that the best solution to this problem um, is to run all possible universes. So you enumerate through all possible rule sets, fundamental rule sets, what you might describe as the kind of the fundamental rules of rules of physics or laws of physics, uh, you run every possible universe uh, and then you make decisions based upon its behavior. Does it look like it's complexifying? Does it look like it's descending into kind of a, an endless tumult of kind of ceaseless chaos? Does it look like it's just going to run down and do absolutely nothing? And you might find that a very, very tiny percentage of this almost not infinite, but extremely large number of universes, you would actually start to see self-organization and complexification. Uh, then you would you would let, the, let you, these universes run and the other universes you would shut down. So the intelligence would come uh, if there was an intelligence, not in kind of sculpting or molding the universe like, you know, like a god, uh, but really in simply letting all possible universes run themselves uh, and, and then, and, and then deciding which ones to shut down and which ones to keep running. Uh, and that could be done by a, you know, a relatively, it wouldn't have to be an omniscient um, kind of God. It, would, it could just be uh, an intelligence that, 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 understand, that understood these things. And these things are things that we can comprehend as well. So I think that we, um, we find ourselves perhaps emergent within 
uh, one of these possible universes that has been set running. Um, and and um, DMT is perhaps some kind of embedded code or technology, or as I describe it in the, the book anyway, is this kind of embedded um, embedded code, really, um, that allows us essentially to get a glimpse, at least minimally, a glimpse outside uh, of this kind of very thin slice of reality that we find ourselves emergent within uh, and, and uh, to give us a glimpse at the larger structure. So that's the <laughs> basic idea. And the, these these bits these aren't um, these aren't atoms, are they? No, no. We're talking about much, 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 much smaller. So really, this goes back to. I mean, it draws a lot on the ideas of um, Ed Fredkin in particular, who was one of the who is. is uh, he's still around, I think, uh, is one of the kind of the founders of what's called digital physics or digital philosophy. Uh, and Stephen Wolfram, of course, has, has also picked up the mantle there um, in, 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 in thinking that perhaps or in kind of um, working from the, the assumption that the ground of reality, uh, you know, the ground of reality is fundamentally digital, that there's a there's a. Uh, a very simple fundamental unit of information you know it could be ones and zeros it could be pluses and minuses it could be seven shades of gray uh, it wouldn't really matter but it would be discrete units um, that would represent information and that they would interact in some way um, according to some kind of fundamental rule set uh, and then from that um, you get the emergence of larger structures. So that what we would call the fundamental particles. So things like, you know, quarks, for example, and, you know, neutrinos and the Higgs boson and all of these things. These are actually higher order structures. And then they themselves self-organize in ways that we do understand to form atoms. And then atoms organize to form molecules all the way up, basically. So you've got you know, many levels of, um, of organization, levels of, of, of complexification, most of them we kind of seem to understand to some degree all the way down to kind of the, the what we think of as the fundamental particles. But there could be layers below that that we don't understand, uh, which would go down to the, you know, this fundamental digital ground of, uh, of reality. Okay. Have you just just out of curiosity, have you ever read Lucretius? I haven't, uh, but um, I mean, a lot of Lucretius's ideas came really from Democritus, mm -hmm. uh, who I do uh, reference in, in the book. You know, the idea that um, the, the ground of the reality, there is this kind of these fundamental units, these what I call in the book, these um, uh, these fundamental pellets of the absolute uh, you know that which cannot be broken down any further, and mm -hmm. that the reality is is fundamentally organised uh, from these units. And of course, Democritus had no idea um, what these things were as such. But I think he was certainly on the right lines in that you know you you break things down fundamentally into smaller and smaller units until you get to a point uh, where you you kind of hit the floor, you hit the ground of reality. Um, and presumably, you know, that is, is how it, it, it works um, in our reality, although, although, you know, much smaller, I think, and, more, and stranger, certainly, than, than Democritus or Lucretius could have envisaged. Mm -hmm. So with, with regards to this, this idea that one thing sort of uh, within your idea, one sort of unit or bit spirals off and begins to complexify like the game of life, um, that hmm. sort of has connections to, I've read a bit of McKenna, but not loads, but I, know, I understand McKenna has a theory that our consciousness evolved from, um, well, his theory is that our consciousness evolved from Homo, is it Homo erectus eating uh, mushrooms? And he believed that that yeah. evolved. So in a sort of abstract way, could we understand that as sort of the point where something spirals off as a bit? <laughs> and then begins to complexify into something else? Or is it way more simple than that, and I'm sort of uh, materialising it? <laughs> well, I think it's, yeah, I mean, certainly these, so it's not that you've got a single bit, it's that you've got, you've got large numbers of these bits. I mean, that's the key point here, is that, is that complex systems 
invariably emerge when you have very large numbers of simple systems that interact. Mm -hmm. um, so the examples that I give in the book, so apart from the game of life, where each each square on the grid is kind of, be, you know, it can be black or white, on or off, dead or alive. Um, you've also got things like um, flocking behaviors of birds, uh, starlings particularly. Uh, and you can see these remarkably beautiful and complex and dynamic configurations and reconfigurations of these birds in the sky. Uh, and the question is, you know, is how do they how do they achieve this? You know, how do they know? Do they have kind of a conductor? Uh, and the answer is no, is that each bird to each individual bird uh, follows a very small number, maybe just two or three very, very simple rules in terms of. Um, you know, whether it follows the bird in front, the distance it keeps between itself and the birds in, in its vicinity, you know, uh, all these you know, very, very simple rules. And yet from it, you get this extremely dynamic uh, and, and complex emergent behavior. Uh, and, and, and you see that at every level of organization. So each bird, of course, is an emergent structure, uh, uh, you know, it's built from cells, living cells. And each cell is itself an emergent structure that's built from this, this complex subcellular network of molecules. And each molecule itself is an emergent structure. So you get, uh, you get emergence all the way down. And, and within one complex system, such as a living organism, uh, you find many levels of, uh, of complexity. You find emergent structures within emergent structures. Um, and so the human brain, so you're talking about, you know, the human, the evolution of the human brain, you know, the human brain is a, is kind of the, uh, the complex emergent structure par excellence. It represents the pinnacle of complexification, at least that, you know, in the, in the known universe that we're aware of anyway, uh, you've got these, the, the emergence of, uh, you know, remarkable, um, uh, properties of computation and representation and uh, calculation and, 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 and prediction and, oh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that this brain can uh, mir almost miraculously achieve. Uh, and yet it's achieving it because it is built from extremely large numbers of simple, much simpler cells um, called, called neurons that, that interact and they interact in extremely complex ways with each other. Uh, and that is where the, these extremely um, uh, complex um, properties of, of the, the entire brain emerges from. Now, that doesn't explain why human brains in particular um, are so different to or seem to be uh, kind of uh, 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 on another level. Uh, when it comes to intelligence, when you compare it to even our closest uh, eight relatives. Um, but still, you know, these, these eight, they still have brains, so they still communicate, they still have some kind of language, uh, the brain is still performing extremely complex behaviors. Uh, but the, it is still something of a mystery of, of, of where human level intelligence came from. And, and you kind of referred to there the stone date, really what you're talking about, the stone date hypothesis. And you know, the, the problem, I guess, with the stone date hypothesis is that it can be uh, if you if you don't understand it or you, you interpret it incorrectly, it, it, it's a kind of a Lamarckian process. So so basically, when in terms of evolution, you've got the accepted form of evolution, which is Darwinian evolution, mm -hmm. which is where certain randomly um, uh, certain random mutations, randomly acquired mutations uh, are either more or less adaptive. They make it more or less likely that you will survive to reproduce, basically. And so those those particularly adaptive features will be selected for. What uh, the alternative, one of uh, Darwin's contemporaries was Lamarck, who suggested that you could acquire some kind of characteristic during your life uh, and then pass that on to your your offspring. Uh, and so some people have suggested that, you know, if you eat the mushroom, that that will somehow change your brain um, in some way. You know, maybe it would increase connectivity. Perhaps these are all perfectly possible, uh, but it's, it's not something you can actually pass on to your your offspring. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 that's the key point here is if, 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 if you want stoned ape theory to work, 
uh, there must be it must be uh, it's got to be heritable. It's got to be something that that can be passed down. So what you can inherit is a taste for mushrooms, perhaps, uh, or a um, some kind of um, drive towards some kind of drug curious curiosity, um, some some drive that would lead you as opposed to other members of your um, uh, of your kind of species uh, towards consuming these mushrooms. And, and that is something that might be passed on. Um, whereas any effect of the mushroom on your, you know, on your physiology whilst you're alive is not going to be passed on. Um, so, so that's why I, I struggle a little bit with stoned ape theory is that uh, it, it's, it's often not properly formulated in a, in, in a, in a kind of proper kind of Darwinian sense uh, in order to kind of make sense. So, yeah. Okay. So the, <laughs> the um, in quotes sort of realities which are formed from taking DMT or doing mushrooms. Yeah. Is there a differentiation between the, the structure of the realities you know, what we consider normal reality and what the reality you go into on a DMT trip, because you're, you're entering into something else, which is still information. But what do you theorize? Is it that you're actually experiencing there in terms of, um, you know, information? Yeah. I mean, you're always so, so kind of a point that I, I labor a little bit is that, that you, whenever you're experiencing a, a reality, it is a reality that is constructed by your brain from information. Um, that that is, if there's anything we've learned uh, from you know a couple of hundred years of, of neuroscience, it, it's that that the your your world is always constructed by your brain, uh, whether it's real or not. So whether that world has a relationship to an environment. Uh, doesn't affect whether or not uh, it's it's you know what it's built from. Your brain is is always constructing a kind of a model um, of uh, which is experienced as your your phenomenal world, uh, and that model is is constructed as this emergent pattern of unified, highly differentiated pattern of information, um, and that's the that is your world. Now, of course, in 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 normal waking life, there is an obvious relationship between that world that you're experiencing and the environment. There seems to be there seems to be an obvious mapping there. And that makes perfect sense. You know, your brain constructs your phenomenal world out of information, but as a model of the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that you can navigate whatever there is out there in the in the external world, in the environment, outside of your brain. The, the world that you experience is designed to allow you to make sense of it, to distinguish between predator and prey, to distinguish between, um, you know, mate, someone you should fuck and someone you should fight. Hmm. Um, and, and, and just to basically just to basically navigate your environment and find food and all of that and all of the other kind of complex stuff that, that we humans do. Um, this world is designed uh, or evolved, should I say, to, to achieve that purpose. It's a functional model. Um, and when you dream at night, of course, you lose access to sensory information, but your brain is still perfectly capable of building the same model. And it does it with, with, with great ease because it's evolved to construct that model. Uh, the difference is that when you're awake is that the way that the model kind of updates from moment to moment is, is, is guided by sensory information. Uh, but there's, but it's not like you're, you ever kind of have access to the world in itself. You only have access to this pattern of stimulation uh, uh, of your nervous system, really. Uh, it's the way that light tickles your retina um, or the way that um, sound waves vibrate uh, your, um, your eardrum. You know, th this is what triggers these electrochemical impulses in your brain and that's the only thing you ever have access to so to speak uh, and so your your brain is really trying to to learn the patterns of sensory information and understand the patterns of sensory information and, and build a functional model so so when you go into the dmt space what your brain is doing is constructing an entirely different model of reality it's still built from information 
Uh, but it seems to be, uh, it seems to bear no relationship whatsoever to the normal waking world. Um, and and it, it's it's not only strange or bizarre; it's inconceivably strange and bizarre. So it's it's not just a world that you wouldn't predict or wouldn't expect. It's a world that you simply could not have anticipated, uh, and and that is that's really part of the kind of the ontological shock. Uh, that goes along, particularly with your first DMT experience, is the shock of being confronted with a world that you could not possibly have anticipated, a world that is uh, seems to be completely impossible, this higher dimensional reality in which you're, you are interacting with and observing nine or ten dimensional objects from all sides at once and you know beings that are singing objects into existence and it, it, it it's something that you simply could not have conceived of before you took dmt uh, and and for me that's the most confounding thing about dmt uh, because as a neuroscientist i know that that if you experience a world it's your brain has to be constructing that world. And so my question is, how the fuck did your brain know how to construct this reality? Uh, because it has to know how to do it. And it does it with great ease. You know, it builds these worlds with a, you know, crystalline clarity. And people describe going to the same types of world, meeting the same kinds of beings, um, the same kind of geometry. And it's like, well, how... When, when did the brain learn to do this? We know how it learned to construct the normal waking world. It did it by sampling sensory information uh, from the from the normal environment over, you know, millennia, millions of years, perhaps even. Uh, you know, it evolved to construct this world, uh, which is why it can do it so effortlessly. But, you know, how did it learn to construct this bizarre world that has no relationship whatsoever uh, to the normal waking world to me that is confounding it's easy to say oh it's just oh it's just a hallucination but that that is a very bad explanation it doesn't really hold water when you actually get down into thinking properly and carefully about what that entails because a hallucination is something the brain constructs it's hallucination is a perception that your brain constructs of its own accord. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, how did the brain learn to construct this, this very, very strange reality filled with intelligent beings, um, you know, extremely intelligent beings? Why would the brain come up with that? Um, that, to me, is, remains a mystery, uh, no matter what people say, um, no matter what the, you know, your standard kind of run-of-the-mill orthodox neuroscientist might say, you know, that it's just hallucination. Um, I don't think they've really thought about it carefully enough because when I, when I see, when I enter these, these kind of realms, I don't come back thinking that was, in, that was a hallucination. I come back thinking I, I have no idea how that was even possible. So do you think there's um, a reason that your brain blocks out the ability to do this, like all the time, <laughs> and it, why it remains within... Uh, these spatiotemporal constraints. Well, of course. I mean, you you have to think that you're, you know, as going back to, you know, what is the purpose of, of your, what is the purpose of perception? What is the purpose of the world that your brain constructs? It's 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 functional. Uh, it, it's it's an adaptive model. It's it's the brain's um, attempt at, at building a model that works. Uh, that doesn't mean it's the truest model. It doesn't mean it's the model that allows your brain to you know, absorb as much information as possible from the environment at all. Your brain is actually in the business, in, in, in kind of the way we think about perception in, in kind of the modern era in the 21st century is that um, your brain is really trying to predict and filter out sensory information. It wants to deal with sensory information itself as little as possible. Because as soon as sensory information enters your brain, it starts stimulating. It starts, 
it stimulates neurons, which then fire. Uh, then every time sensory information comes into your brain from the environment, it risks disturbing uh, the harmony, risks disturbing the system. And so ideally, your brain says, OK, I've got this model. It seems to work. Um, what I'm going to try and do is use this model to predict sensory information. And if I predict the sensory information correctly, I'm just going to stop that, you know, block that sensory information uh, and, and, and simply rely on the model because the model is working. And it's only when the brain kind of fails in, in making good um, predictions about sensory information that it kind of updates its model, it absorbs that information. So your brain really is trying to maintain itself. And it does that um, by actually filtering out as much sensory information as as possible. Um, yeah, and so so the question then is, so what happens then when when DMT enters the brain? Why is the brain suddenly filled with uh, information that seems to be completely different? Uh, you know, it's not like your world model has just been kind of shattered. Uh, it's it's like it's been completely dismantled and then an entirely new one reconstructed, uh, one that's far more complex, uh, far more intricate, uh, seemingly much higher dimensional. Uh, and it's like, w w why is that the option? Why is that the way to go? It doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, you know, if something is, if, if a drug is somehow um, destabilizing the system, the brain, which it really is. You know, it's the brain is always poised between order and disorder. What psychedelics do is they seem to tip the brain towards more disorder. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and that makes sense when you think about kind of if you think about regular doses of other psychedelics, you think of a, a gram of dried mushrooms, for example, you can you can sense, you can feel your, the world starting to become more fluid less predictable objects seem to change their identity a little bit it's become everything become kind of confusing and yeah the brain is kind of losing control of the world that it's it, the model that it's constructing uh, and that makes sense then if you take you know too much uh, then things start to disintegrate even more then you can completely lose your kind of bearings and okay that makes sense as well but then with dmt it's like you go past all of that you go from order to disorder and chaos and then to this entirely new order uh, that that bears no relationship whatsoever to the old order oh so you don't you don't think there's connections you don't think that um not to sound too paranoid and conspiratorial, but you don't think in this, mm. this, this higher order is affecting our regular adaptive state? Oh, I do, yeah. But I, I think, well, this is, this is really the great question. Is, um, so, so the question really that is often formulated as, is the DMT world constructed by your brain or is it a real kind of objective reality? Mm -hmm. Now, that's the wrong question, right? Because as, uh, as we've just kind of discussed, a world is always constructed by your brain, mm -hmm. right? So the question you might ask, um, you know, is, is this the world you're experiencing now? You might reasonably ask yourself, uh, is it a, a real world, a normal waking world, or, is, or am I dreaming? Mm -hmm. Now, the world would be the same in both cases. The difference would be that in the dream case, uh, there would be no sensory information coming from the environment, right? Um, so you can think about the same kind of question with the DMT world. Is, is, it, is it like a, a kind of a, uh, a dream in that it's, it's, it's a world that your brain is constructing entirely of its own accord? Or is it kind of like a waking world? Is it a sensed world? Is it a world that is actually being modulated by sensory information from some other place? just like the normal waking world is, except it's not, you know, the normal waking world. It's not the normal environment that we're familiar with, you know, that we receive information from via the normal kind of sensory uh, conduits. Um, there seems to be some way, perhaps, that your brain is able to start receiving patterns of information from some other place to which it normally has no access. Uh, you know, and how is DMT achieving that? How is DMT changing the the way that you, the information that your brain generates such that it's suddenly able to kind of gate the flow of information from this other reality 
uh, that that would be the explanation for uh, for what DMT is doing. But of course, you know, uh, any kind of standard orthodox neuroscientist would scoff at that idea because there does seem to be no way that your brain is capable of. Uh, there's no obvious route by which in, information from some other reality, you know, some other dimension of reality could enter the brain. Uh, that's really the question. This is what I call the data input problem. Where does the data come from? Uh, if you are really interacting with another world, another reality filled with intelligent beings, conscious intelligent beings, how does your brain get access? Because that's really the that's really the puzzle. It's not that these worlds exist. These worlds exist. There's nothing in physics that says that there can't be alternate dimensions filled with intelligent beings. Mm -hmm. The question really is, how is it possible for us to access them? And mm -hmm. that is a data, it's a data problem. It's, it's how, how does the brain get access to information from that other reality? So in terms of, um, I'm sort of hoping you're familiar roughly with, with uh, the work of Kant, because this is... This seems, mm. for, to me, to mirror what Kant is on about. Do you think that DMT is an access to the thing in itself, or do you think that that world we're going to again is just another representation that we're given, and there might actually be something beyond that? Well, I think I think it's that you're faced with the same issue. I, I don't <laughs> think it's a, so. I think you, you're in the exactly the same position in that. So, for listeners, I guess. So in the normal waking world, we're always faced with the issue of uh, we only have access to the phenomenon, right? So the phenomenon being the phenomenal world, your experience, subjective reality. Um, and we assume that there is the noumenon, which is the world in itself that exists outside and beyond your perceptions. Um, and and that there, is, there is assumed to be some kind of relationship between the world in itself uh, and, and your phenomenal world. And that makes sense. Uh, but of course, you only ever have access to your subjective uh, phenomenal world, the phenomenon. And as for the way I see it, the same is true in the DMT space. Uh, you know, you're entering a, 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 some kind of other reality. That's that's for sure that, that you're entering a different phenomenal world, that your phenomenon is changing uh, dramatically. Um, but it will always, it's still your phenomenon. Now, the question then, I guess, to reformulate the question um, we had before is, is how, it, has the noumenon changed? Uh, is there a different, uh, or, is, or is there somehow your brain interacting with a different aspect of the noumenon? Uh, that, that would be how I would see it, in that somehow your brain is, is receiving information uh, from a greater uh, number of dimensions or greater part of this uh, of the noumenon of kind of uh, the larger structure of, 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 of reality whereas in the normal waking world you know your normal waking life you're receiving a, a much limited sample if you like of, of information and somehow that expands uh, when when DMT enters the brain and of course that doesn't explain exactly how DMT achieves that which I do discuss uh, at some length in the book, uh, but but it kind of hopefully it kind of sets up the problem. So, so for you, do you sort of subsume any alterations of time into the same sense data like like Camp would, you know? Because I've, I've done D DMT mm. myself, but I've heard there is um, sort of relatively severe alterations to your perception of time. Yeah, I mean that's that's something which I don't I, I don't think about it too much because the problem is is that the Again, you, you lead to the, the issue of, of, of changes in actual time or changes in perceived time. Um, we certainly know for a fact that one's perception of time dramatically alters uh, you know, under the influence of the majority of psychedelic drugs. You know, people describe it taking them an aeon to, to climb a flight of stairs you know, after they've taken acid. Um, uh, and uh, whereas, of course, in, in truth, time hasn't actually changed, right, to any kind of external observer. Um, now, again, when you go into the DMT space, there, there seems to be this kind of timeless quality to it in that uh, time doesn't seem to work in the same way. You, you enter a realm where um, it, it, it feels like the DMT space has or somehow always been there uh, and 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 the question i guess is 
does is that because you are truly entering a timeless realm where the rules of time somehow do not apply or is it simply that the way that your brain is simply not equipped to make sense uh, you know because you know you, you, your your brain how does your brain measure time well there are a number of ways it does it but it has to form representations about you know what's going on from moment to moment and kind of make judgments uh, and so you know the, your brain is always kind of constructing a model of time which is kind of always part of your model of reality um uh, and and you know that's why time could become very very fluid and time can seem to move quickly or or much more slowly under certain circumstances because the brain is having to construct this model of time um which is obviously distinct from clock time um and so that you know the, when when you're in the DMT space your brain is constructing this extremely bizarre hyperdimensional model and it's perhaps not surprising that it struggles to create a timeline for you there uh, which is perhaps what's going on so whether there's actually a you really are entering a place where time doesn't apply or whether there are different rules or yeah, yeah it's it's a messy it's a messy problem which is why i don't <laughs> i don't deal with it too much okay one of the really interesting things you say early on is that um, we have become the alien societies of our fictions mm. so in what way of uh, these alien societies sort of manifested themselves in our in our reality well yeah and this is a kind of an ongoing process but i do i when I, when you kind of look at the world as a human and whether this is illusory or not uh, you there is this this kind of ostensible disjoint between human civilization and the so-called natural world, the world of forests and mountains and, and rivers. There seems to be something strange about what we do, uh, the way that um, cityscapes kind of crystallize um, from steel and glass, kind of shimmering and, uh, you know, electronic. Everything, it seems completely separate. It seems non-Earth-like. Uh, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like we're becoming less and less like citizens of the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing that manifest in what you might say uh, regard as quite positive ways. Right. So the way that we are able to manipulate our environment in, in, in good ways, um, we can we can communicate instantaneously you know, across the planet. Uh, we can travel to and fro, you know, in person across the planet. We can we can reach up uh, towards the heavens, at least. We can look at uh, um, you know, different parts of the galaxy and, you know, towards the edge of the universe. All of these things uh, are kind of, I guess, positive things in a way. But we we also see the negative sides of it as well in the kind of the continual exploitation and destruction of our of our environment. Uh, in that we we've lost the ability. Again, it goes back to this tension, right? Uh, we've 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 lost our connection to um, the rest of um, the natural world. We don't we don't seem to be part of the ape lineage anymore. We've seem to have cut the umbilical cord, if you like. Uh, and so that's what I see. That's why I see us as becoming kind of like, um, the, you know, the aliens of, of science fiction, you know, of uh, not necessarily just aliens kind of flying around in, in silvery kind of super light speed discs, but as, as aliens uh as in beings that do that are not from the earth, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what I mean by an alien. Uh, and we we become more and more we seem to resemble a species that it doesn't belong here. Uh, and and in a way, it feels like the earth uh, would do well to kind of shrug us off. And that when McKenna spoke about us leaving the, the earth. Uh, and shedding our material bodies or whatever, or these kind of post-human ideas of uploading ourselves somehow into some kind of digital um, hyperspace or whatever, um, that that might be something that has to happen um, sooner or later. The alternative being that we would simply destroy ourselves and the Earth at the same time. Uh, so it seems to be kind of a, a race against time, I think. Um, is there anything you you feel that's key that we've we've missed or you'd like to add? 
Um, I don't know. It was pretty intense stuff there. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I think um, I think we're, we're we're just really getting to grips now uh, with with DMT. I think we're going to see in the next sort of ten or twenty years. You know, DMT is uh, the kind of the scientific study of DMT has really opened up together with 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 the other psychedelics, and you're seeing now a, a torrent. Really, of, of scientific studies that are that are starting to elucidate and reveal um, what these drugs are actually doing um, in the brain, uh, and how you know, how they have these effects on consciousness. You know, from the level of interactions with uh, receptors in the brain uh, through to effects on global brain activity. Uh, but also, I think if we're really going to get to the bottom of of DMT, we have to confront the fact at some point that we might be dealing with uh, a true uh, intelligence that does not uh, that does not have its origins uh, in this universe. Uh, that, to me, is going to be m- the, the great leap. I guess that would be the great leap. Uh, you know, this kind of transcendental leap um, that human that humankind. Uh, could never have anticipated, uh, really, uh, that, that there could be these, not only that there could be intelligences existing outside of our universe, which, yeah, you could, you could, uh, you could uh, theorize that these are perfectly possible and, and maybe even plausible. Uh, but the idea that it's possible for us to, with great facility and by inhaling a couple of lungfuls of one of the simplest plant alkaloids uh, in the world, um, that you can actually effortlessly communicate and establish communication with such intelligences. I think that would be the greatest discovery in in the history of of humankind, if that were to be uh, validated. So I think, you know, in parallel, you know, alongside these kind of functional neuroimaging and and phenomenological studies of of psychedelics that are going on and clinical uses as well, which are also going to be revolutionary in in psychiatry. uh, I think it's important that we actually think about who it is we might be actually communicating with and meeting with and um, establishing uh, two-way uh, diplomatic relations um, with uh, on the other side of, of the veil. And, um, and, and that's something that particularly interests me, uh, is, 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 is realizing, I think, that DMT in particular is a technology and that should be treated as a technology uh, and that there are ways to... Uh, there are ways to develop it. It's not simply a case of sitting on a, a rug and, uh, and, and, and using a glass pipe, you know, raising a hand-blown glass pipe to the lips and taking a couple of lungfuls, but that there, there might be much more efficient and effective technological ways uh, to, to enter and maintain entry in the DMT space and, and establish stable two-way communication uh, with intelligences uh, not, of, not, not of this universe. So, from your um, personal experience, what are, mm. what's the intelligence like, or how does it manifest itself? Or, I mean, the, the, what's clear about the DMT space is that it, it is teeming with intelligence. Um, it's not like there is, you know, just a kind of a handful. It's not like walking into uh, a, 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 a semi-crowded room. Um, you know, like a dinner party or something. It's like walking into a place that is filled, you know, to the brim with with with, with intelligence, and and it's so pervasive that you get the feeling, the sense of the intelligence is is so pervasive and powerful that you you start to feel it as you're before you even get into the DMT space, as you're kind of hurtling through this. Uh, this kind of tunnel of, of, of complex, this complex procession of complex geomet- uh, geometric forms, you, you get this very, very strong, profound sense that this place is going to be filled with intelligence. It's hard to explain um, until you've been there. But once you've been there, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then when you do enter the space, um, there's often a multitude of different types of intelligence um, with a multitude of different intent, uh, levels of intelligence, uh, types of entities, um, 
ways of interacting with them. Uh, it, it, it's it's an extremely diverse, hyper-dimensional ecology that you're bursting into when you when you take DMT, uh, and that's what people need to be uh, aware of, and 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 that's why you will never really get to the bottom of DMT, I think, but using standard approaches, uh, standard methods of administration. You know, three or four minutes in that space is 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 certainly. It's sufficient, perhaps, to kind of orient yourself, um, but that's about it. By the time you've oriented yourself and uh, kind of established some kind of communication with one of the in- or more of the intelligences in there, you're but you're basically being pulled out again. You know, the drug is wearing off, um, and it's it's not a particularly diplomatic uh, way of uh, of approaching somebody else's realm uh, to kind of burst in there wide-eyed for five minutes, have a look around in awe and then kind of bugger off again. Um, I don't think it's the way that, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of unbecoming of a species of our intelligence that has stumbled across this technology. Um, I think we need to treat it as a technology and treat the entities and the intelligences that lie within the DMT space with, uh, you know, requisite respect. Um, and that means learning to use the drug properly, you know, learning to administer it in ways that you can maintain stable brain levels of, of, of DMT uh, over time such that you can bring somebody into the space, um, hold them there uh, for as long as required, you know, whether that be 30 minutes or 30 hours. I mean, there's, there's no limits, really. You know, DMT has these remarkable pharma- pharmacological peculiarities in that it doesn't exhibit tolerance. It is very short acting. You know, it has these 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 unique uh, properties that mean that that you can use um, intravenous infusion type techniques to actually maintain levels of DMT in the brain over time. You know, one doesn't have to be restricted to kind of traditional modes of administration. Um, I believe are you running some courses or was it? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so on my YouTube channel, uh, I currently have a 42 video lesson course. It's called Psychedelics and the Brain or Psychedelic Neuroscience Master Course. Um, and it's basically, in my opinion, well, not in my opinion, I think as an objective fact, it is the most comprehensive, detailed um, uh, course on the, le- on the effects of psychedelic drugs uh, in the brain, how they work, you know, from the level of drug receptor interactions to how that affects neurons to how that affects global brain activity and the structure of your world and all of that kind of stuff it's all in there over uh, over eight units um 42 video lessons each is each is only sort of 15 to 25 minutes uh, and you don't really need any prerequisites beyond kind of high school biology uh, so anyone that really wants to understand what's going on in the brain when someone takes a psychedelic drug uh, should go to um, go to my uh, YouTube channel. My my handle is Alien Insect, uh, and it's also my Twitter handle and my Instagram handle are also the same, Alien Insect. Um, so you know, follow me there for for kind of updates and uh, new courses and new books and, and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, yeah, Andrew Gallimore, thanks very much. Thank you.